Okay, so we here we are, uh, at another um, live interview. Um, and what a great guest we've got for you uh, tonight. It's the, the guy that's uh, won a double-double, which is uh, an IMBA and AMCA uh, title on two consecutive years, 2009-2010. He won both titles. Um, add into that, he also won uh, two AMCA MX1 titles and a Superclass title. Um, and so uh, let's introduce the guy who's achieved all that. Um, it's Mr. Lee Dunham. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me on your show. And hello to everyone back at home watching. Okay, it's, it's great great to have you on tonight, Lee. Um, right, um, so we've got to start, really, with that those double-double winning years. Um, obviously, when you sit down now um, and see your name in the history books, um, which nobody can deny you, it must give you... Um, a lot of satisfaction um, when you know the endless hours of training, practicing, you know, going to the meetings, travel, traveling thousands of miles, um, to, to see your name in there and think that for the effort you put in, you got that reward. That that, that must still feel good, yeah? It, to be totally honest, that was part of my whole goal with, uh, with the racing. Um, when I was a schoolboy and when I was kind of going into the adult scenes, I wanted to give, um, oh, sorry, I wanted to have something on a piece of paper to show my kids what I used to do when I was younger. And um, of course, that started off in 2004 or 2005 with the KWS Championship. And as soon as I won that, it became apparent every single year that there was a previous riders or previous winners uh, in the back of their program. And that was it's a similar thing. It was so good to open a program and see your name in amongst all of those other guys uh, and girls that have previously won it. And it just made you feel uh, like all of that effort, all of that hard work was worthwhile. And the double-double um, is just the ultimate goal. It's, it's what everyone kind of dreams of, if you like, and it was so um, uh, rewarding after countless hours of training and countless hours of, of driving and, and traveling and, and like you said, all the miles. And of course, you know as well as I do, because we used to travel together, there was, a, you know, some serious road trips along the way um, to go with all of that effort. And it was it was rewarding, not just on my side, but, as you know, as a collective, as a family and a team effort to, to win those two championships. And of course there was like super stiff opposition in the UK and in Europe. Um, I think even in, in Europe, uh, there was 11 or 12 people that had previously won the IMBA championship that we were racing against. Um, so that made it pretty, pretty special. And the other thing of course was um, both titles I won in Europe um, in the final rounds. And the, and the first one was actually in, in Holland. And I didn't actually know I won because the points were so close between Phil and I. And it wasn't until I got soaked in champagne um, that I actually realized that I'd won at that point because the tannoy was going off and you could hear my name and you could hear Phil's name. And, and you know, we had actually knew what the guy was saying because he was talking in foreign. Um, but to, you know, to break it all down and to have all of that come into, you know, the, the, the championships and, and to see, your, you know, like you said, to see your names on those, um, on those trophies and on those uh, uh, magazines and, and, and everything else that a lot went along with it was just something special. I'm so pleased actually to not do it or not be in there anymore, but at the same time, it's nice to be on, um, you know this side of the fence and look back and, and know that you've you've done it that's yeah it is nice it's a, it's a good uh, it's a good feeling yeah okay obviously after that double double you went on and won two amca mx1 titles and a superclass title um when you look at them all collectively is is there sort of any that sort of any moment within those sort of title winning years that sort of stands out for you above everything else or 
did it all seem special? Uh, it's, it's they're all special in their own way. Um, probably the first one and probably the last one uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but the first double double was particularly good because that was my first major majors. Um, and also because in the first one I was racing Phil and we put in, you know, both of us had literally given everything we possibly had and more. Um, and because the points were just so close, you know, eventually in the, uh, in the European championship to eventually win that was just crazy. Um, and the final year, um, you know, the retirement year and to win that and retire on the same day, that was pretty special as well because it kind of put all of those emotions of the whole year and no one really knew that I was stopping apart from, you know, me and, you know, my family and things. And we knew that before we'd even started that year, uh, that that was going to be my final year and we put everything into it, um, you know, achieved our goals, which was great. And again, it was a, it was just a massive m mixed barrel of emotions, you know, on the podium um, to, you know, win the championship, but also know deep down that it was at that point that it was never, ever going to happen again, you know, for me, sorry. So, uh, yeah, massive, massive mixed, mixed emotions from the, from the first to the last, but, but, if I was to highlight two, it would, it would probably be the first one uh, and the last one. Okay. Okay. Um, on, on that year when you, you did decide to call it a day, um, had you always thought in your own mind that that was it? Or, you know, had, had you sort of planned it? Because um, you were only 28, I think, at the time. And, and, you know, everybody was saying, you know, why is he retired? He's, he's got, you know, a few years left in him yet. So had, had you always thought, at that point in your career, no matter what had happened, that that was going to be it, or uh, yeah. you know, how, how, did, how did that come into your mind? So, the, truth be told, I wanted to retire the year before, uh, but of course, I finished second, um, and I knew what I wanted to do after I'd finished racing, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to do what I wanted to do to the to the level that I'm kind of doing it now uh, if I'd finished. Um, if I'd finished second in, you know, in that final year, I wanted to make sure that I was achieving my goals or achieve my goals to the best of my ability and know that my last race or final race in my final year, I, I could walk away and know that I'd achieved that or done my, you know, best I possibly could, close that door and then walk into, the, you know, my next go okay i mean obviously you, you spent a lot of time going to these imba events and whatever um and you made lots of friends along the way uh, mainly dutch friends uh and i know what you know after a long journey you, you used to like it enjoying yourself you know on a saturday afternoon the day before the event and i know that you you particularly like to uh invite the dutch to like a, a pit bike challenge or two um have you got any sort of stories that you could sort of uh, let us uh, know about um during those pit bike racing experiences uh before i you know disclose any of these information is any of the team great britain watching for the last from the last eight years is anyone from europe watching for the last eight years is there any officials in switzerland that are watching <laughs> uh it i mean yeah, the, the uh, and I guess that's that's part of it was the the you know the friendship and kind of the connections that you had and the networking that you had over in Europe uh, because everyone was just super friendly, super helpful, um, and they always wanted to be a part of your setup. Now, whether they were racing you or not the next day is a different story, and whether they wanted to beat you the next day is a completely different story. They were always friends. And that, that's kind of what made Europe so special. Um, the pit biking side of things was fantastic because, of course, we had a whole host of UK guys that had uh, pit bikes. We always did, um, you know, put them in the trucks. It's literally, the moment we got there, the pit bikes were out and we were checking out 
the, the local towns to the circuit to everything in between um there's a whole host of stories i mean we've people have ended up in hospital with stitches on their knees someone's girlfriend almost lost an eye um someone almost fell off a cliff in switzerland nick harris and i almost died in one of those bendy buses and we ended up in someone's allotment um the, i mean the they're endless, absolutely endless, um, but just crazy fun. I mean, it wasn't just the pit bikes. We, I mean, I remember getting a phone call on, I think I was at the German border on the way to uh, Kleinhau, and uh, they were updating me on a, on a situation that um, that happened at, at, the, at the beer tent in Kleinhau. And I think uh, if you ever get a chance to interview Rob Clifford, then by all means, just have me on as a sideline because it was i'll let him fill in with the story but it involved vodka and eyes so um anyway that's a, that's another another one um we we kind of used the as a, as a meet and greet as well because even um even people that you're racing against and of course the 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 um the tension is super high uh, on race day, but it was just such a nice chance to relax and and um, kind of get to know uh, the the people that you're racing against and new faces and 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 whatnot. But the the other side of that, it was it was super serious the next day, and and of course pit bikes were only for a certain time, and then of course it was completely shut to one side, and then we were focused on the on the job of the of the next day. Um, but yeah, no, on the whole, huge huge um uh friendship group there through through the through the pit bikes yeah okay obviously they, they were great times uh, but let's go right back to the beginning of your racing career and i'm i'm guessing that the way you entered into the sport was obviously through your dad mike who was um no mean racer yourself is that is that correct is that your are you become involved in the sport initially yeah, so uh, Dad obviously used to race. Um, he always tells me that he was like way, way, way better than I ever was, um, and still does now. Even if we're out on the track, he's still he's still way better than I was. You know, um, he he got me involved in the sport, got me hooked on bikes. Um, started off with a PW with stabilizers, and just it went from there. Really, we. We were quite fortunate to live in an area that um, the locals didn't mind us using their fields and, and things. And of course, Dad was already, you know, he had, he had a track set up in someone's, you know, someone's field. So um, learned to ride in there. Uh, progressed on to watching um, videos of schoolboy racing and uh, getting involved in that way, going along, watching, and then eventually, you know, entering into my first race. And I'll never forget it. I was absolutely shit scared. Um, I, you, of course, you have to wear a high vis vest, a uh, high vis vest, or you did back in the day. And the only high vis we had was uh, one of my sister's horse riding ones, and it said, "Please pass wide and slow." And I felt super embarrassed. Um, but hey, everyone's got to start somewhere, and um, yeah, did that. And it took me a whole year to earn my first trophy. I think I finished tenth, and um, I've still got the trophy now, which is pride of place, along with all of the rest, which is great. Uh, progressed up through the ranks. Um, eventually, my kind of my goal was to end up riding for Team Green, and that happened, I think, when I was about fourteen, which was a massive achievement for me. That was. I, you know, I felt amazing, you know, once I got selected and, you know, I was joined into part of that kind of um, support from a manufacturer. And it then led on to the next step. Um, and, of course, the next step went from youth racing um, through into, into the adult adult scene. And at the time, um, Team Green Riders either went into racing uh, for professional teams such as MJ Church or you know, LPE or, uh, you know, something like that. At the time, it was MJ Church. Um, or there was the option of riding for dealerships. And from that dealership, um, 
package, that's where I ended up racing for Motor Extreme Kawasaki. And then of course from there, it then led off into, into the AMCA and the IMBA scene, which was, you know, it was fantastic. It was it perfectly fitted into my kind of uh, routine and, and situation at the time because, you know, work obviously was, was the important side and, you know, racing was the fun and you had to train before work and after work. And, you know, sometimes it was even during work as well. You were doing everything you possibly could just to kind of gain that little step into your uh, program. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's um, looking back actually, probably, probably haven't really looked back quite as far as when, we, when I first started. Um, looking back, you know, the stories and the, and the kind of things that we've done over those 25 years has been, you know, it's been a lot, a lot of bikes. Okay, like while you were racing then in your youth days, at what sort of point was it when you, th you sort of felt, oh yeah, you know, I can do this, you know, and you could feel that you were making good progress. You know, how many years into it did you, what did it take before you thought, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, at the front of the packs or one day? I don't know. Um, it, ultimately, it's always the dream. It's always the goal. Um, and I don't know if I, I truly, you know, felt that I could have achieved what I did until I was actually in uh, that situation. Um, um, but you know, part of part of being a youth rider, you're kind of guided a little bit by your parents, aren't you? Because you know, as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, ten-year-old, uh, the decisions are ultimately your parents. I mean, it's not often you see an eight-year-old guiding their self around the UK racing. Um, the uh, I was quite fortunate there, where I had my dad that had already ridden, he had already raced, he already had track craft, he already kind of knew the the ropes. Um, and then eventually, when I became uh, part of Motor Extreme Kawasaki, then of course I was teamed up with Huck, and Huck then you know took me and guided me and showed me the the ropes, if you like. Um, and I was quite fortunate there to become really, really close friends with Huck. And he guided me an awful lot on and off the circuit, taught me how to like kind of correct negativity into positivity. And um, he taught me how to um, make a plan of my whole career so that I had a start point, I had a midpoint, I had a finish point, and I had kind of mini goals in between those points to always keep me on track to where I actually wanted to be. Um, but going back to your question of when did I actually realize that I could, you know, achieve goals or win or, or you know, um, be at the front, I don't actually think that I realized that until I wanted to do it myself. Um, of course, I had, you know, my dad and Huck and, you know, Brian Wheeler and a couple of other people that were helping me outside. Um, but someone actually telling you, you know, you can do it to you actually believing that you can do it. I think it's two, two different things there. Um, and it wasn't until I actually wanted to do it for myself that then I was able to kind of teach myself in a way what was working, what wasn't working, how I could do this, how I could do that, or what clearly wasn't working for me. You know, it's pointless doing that because I knew that it wasn't, wasn't going to be effective. I knew that it wasn't going to work for me. Um, but hey, you know, happy days all, um, all ended up all, all right in the end. So yeah, please. Okay. W whilst you're talking about ARC, um, I think it was 2008, you joined, um, the, what you called the, the professionals, um, training school. Do you, do you think that was the point when you sort of went from being a championship contender into a, a championship winner? Do you think that was the major sort of tipping point? You know, that, that involvement with the professionals and with up that, that, that was where you went up a, up a sort of another notch again. It was a point where I changed my ment my, um, my mental attitude towards the racing a hundred percent, definitely. Um, and also 
it was it was a time that you know I was guided differently. Um, the, the the idea with the uh, the professionals uh, training uh, was absolutely you know perfect, and it was exactly what I needed at the time. Um, you know, I had a huck, if you like, that was guiding me on my physical side. Um, and I had Bry Wheeler on track side, uh, you know, whenever we were, you know, I was helping on one of their days or, or even participating in one of their days. I learned an awful lot from, from what Bry was talking and, and you know, and telling me. Um, you know, I, don't, I think that his mentality, his track craft, his, his wisdom and um, everything in between and his bike setup and his bike skills is just on a completely different level, and I, I learned an awful lot the whole time I was I was with them. Whether it was you know helping them or whether they were helping me, it was it was just a massive uh, gain on on on, um, on my side. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, I also gained a lot from the races as well because I think it was two thousand and two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Um, and you gain an awful lot of confidence from running with those guys that you probably didn't think you could run with before as well um, and that instantly gives you the confidence boost to uh, you know believe that you should be there um, and as soon as you've got that that you've got that self-belief that you can actually get into that position or be in that position, or uh, you know, achieve goals, podiums, wins, you know, seconds, whatever it may be. Um, as, so, as soon as you've got that self belief, that's motivation. You're almost disappointed when you're not, it, or, or you haven't achieved those those, you know, top five, three, two, one, whatever it may be. Um, and if you've got that inner kind of desire, you've got that inner kind of go and fire in your belly to achieve those points, then you, I think that's half the battle then. Because it ultimately it doesn't matter whether it's rain, shine, snow, sand, or mud, uh, your your goals are already set. And if you don't get there, then you are beating yourself up for the drive all the way home. Uh, and certainly for me, I needed to. Um, if I didn't achieve what I I told myself I was going to achieve, then that was it. I was kicking myself in the gym the the whole next week and the whole way up to the next round. So I made sure I was never in that position again. Um, and as you know, it, that stemmed, I think, from you know, Huck and, and Bry, and you know, my dad, and also Kev Bancroft and, and Roger, and you know, a couple of other people that were on, you know, in my corner that were always, you know, giving me these little bits that were helping me. So, okay. yeah, um, on, on after the Moto Extreme um, days, um, you then got a place on the um, LPE Kawasaki. Um, team, which uh, that was the the official um, Kawasaki U, UK team. Um, who, when, when you joined that team, um, who was your teammates um, at LPA? Can you remember? Uh, um, yeah, so the, the whole LPE thing came around when um, it was actually Kawasaki that uh, pulled me from Motor Extreme to LPE Kawasaki. Um, and I remember going to, I think it was the NEC or something, and meeting Steve for the first time and just being 100%, you know, fell at home straight away. Um, and it was, you know, texting the next day and phone calls, and Steve was just super, super appreciative of everything. And that was exactly, you know, what I needed. Um, and his support was just second to none. And along with the teammates as well, I, mean, I think we had Christian, um, Bry, and Gert uh, later on in the year was Gert. Oh, no, sorry. Um, no, Wayne, Wayne Smith, I think, was the, to start off with. Uh, have I got the wrong years? There was... One year there was Jordan Rose, Wayne Smith, Bry, and Christian, and then I think later in that year, then Gert then came into into the setup. Uh, but of course, you know, 
brought a bunch of teammates. It, it was just a collective knowledge base that I was able to just pull little bits from uh, with bike set up and, you know, try their bikes, go out riding with them, um, you know, tag onto the back of what they were doing. They would tag onto the back of what I'm doing, you know, we'd help each other out. We were always testing, we were always trying new things. Um, and of course, they were great friends as well. Gert's still a real good friend. Um, whenever I see Christians, you know, again, it's like, mate, same with Bry. Um, but yeah, no, it was just such a great setup uh, right from day one all the way, all the way through to the last day as well. Uh, the 2012 um, Martin Barr, I think, was on MX2. Um, then there was Ray Rousen, and we had, well, of course, Ray and I had known each other from the Team Green days in, from day one, um, all the way up through. And of course, we were back in teammates again in, in LP Kawasaki, and I'll never forget with Ray, we had, um, we, we were at Fat Cats, and we'd finished training, and we were on our way back, and we decided to have a first gear race at the end of uh, the Fat Cat's driveway. And of course, you know, first gear in vans, um, his van just lit up and it left this dirty, great big 11Z up the driveway of Fat Cat's. And I was thinking, oh God, here we go. Um, bearing in mind that we were the only two there, so we couldn't even blame someone else. Um, Anyway, Ray felt so bad and I felt so bad. And of course, luckily I wasn't the one, you know, that did it, it was Ray. And uh, I remember sat in the service station, just hands in my, head in my hands thinking, we, we're gonna have to ring Martin, we're gonna have to tell him. Um, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to tell him. And uh, in, in the end, Ray ended up giving him a call and a sob story and we, I think we came up with we accidentally, uh, we were passing the sat nav and his foot clipped off a, uh, foot, foot slipped off the clutch and ended up spinning up the driveway. But yeah, it was, that was a funny old uh, five minutes that was. Um, and 2013, uh, back at LP again. Um, and the team that was with us then was, br I, was Bry and Gert. Um, I'm sure Steve will help me out here, actually. I can't remember who, who the teammates were in 2013. Definitely Gert, but I can't remember who was, um, who, who, who was on MX2. Maybe Bry. Uh, but yeah, we had, um, we had a blast all the way through. And as soon as I was at LPE, providing Steve was going to have me for you know, remainder, I was quite set and I was quite happy to stay there. There was no, there was never a doubt in my mind that I was, you know, that I was ever going to, um, you know, change teams or, or warrant going to another manufacturer or, or whatever. I'd already kind of invested my um, uh, program into that setup and it worked absolutely uh, perfectly. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the whole, kind of structure about LPE gave me a really strong foundation that I was able to bring into the AMCA and it was able to um, uh, structure my days and my, and my riding similar to what Gert and Brian and everyone else was doing. I was able to, you know, see, see um, you know, what they were doing and able to bring kind of what they were, how they were riding, how they were structuring their qualifying and their starting and of course their, their motos. And, and I was able to do a similar thing to what they were doing into um, into the AMCA, and, it, and again, it worked worked great. Yeah, I was happy happy there, definitely. Can, can you see that on screen, Lee? There's the answer from Steve about who was in the team. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, Ando and uh, Doran, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember having a game of squash with Ando, and... Um, we were we were in a real small village up near where Steve lives and um, having a game of squash and I was beating Ando and as you can imagine he was just getting fired right up uh, I mean to the point that rackets were 
against the wall, the floor, the roof, the, the ball was going everywhere. And um, it was a shame that I was laughing so hard. Uh, but it was oh, brilliant, absolutely, uh, yeah. And again, you know, pulling ideas out of what Ando was doing, um, you know, into my setup was just, you know, it was a dream come true. Okay, so they, they were obviously really happy days, but I think that proved again how committed you were to the cause, you know, because obviously Steve was based in Anal, which is quite a journey from where from where you're located, but you you know, you were putting that hard work in, those hard miles, if you want, to, to get to where you wanted to be to. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't think anyone minds driving anywhere, do they? Providing you're kind of getting what you want out of it. You know, an extra, I mean, most circuits from where I live are, you know, the, the race circuits, if you like, sorry, there's plenty of practice circuits, but the race circuits are, you know, still an hour or so away, but, you, you know, an extra hour or so, you don't, don't mind too much providing you're getting what you what you need or what you what you want back from from your day and uh yeah absolutely well worth um the commitment the time and the effort being part of lpa okay um right i mean obviously during your racing days um that certainly didn't apply um but where did that come from that the nickname dangerous uh so dangerous was um something that huck gave me and uh, it started off when we first went training. He uh, said to me, I'll meet you at Fitness First Bristol. And I know he can't give me some abuse. Well, actually, he probably could give me some abuse, no, no. But if he was, <laughs> he was, um, uh, so Huck said, uh, I'll, I'll meet you at Fitness First Bristol. So, um, I said to him, yeah, all right, no worries. I've already booked my induction. I'll see you there at whatever time it was. So I sat there and I was waiting for three quarters of an hour. And um, I gave him a call and I said, mate, where are you? You know, I've been here for like almost an hour. And uh, he said, I'm by reception. I looked over there and there was no one to be seen. Uh, what he didn't tell me was there was actually two fitness firsts in Bristol. So he was at one that was the other side of Bristol. And of course, I'm sat in this one, you know, all suited and booted, ready to go into, you know, some some training. And, and he's sat in the other one, you know, 30 minutes away. So I literally ran out of the gym, jumped into my car, flat out over to, you know, his side of Bristol, jumped into fitness first. And he said, you are dangerous. And as soon as he said that, that was it. It was just stuck then. Uh, so um, hopefully no one thinks I'm dangerous for riding or anything like that or you know thinks that <laughs> the, the dangerous side of things is is in relation to racing at all but no it was for him and uh yeah it seemed like um it stuck okay and throughout your racing career you were always racing on kawasaki machinery i think that's correct um yeah. you, you know at any point at all did you sort of think oh I wouldn't mind having a go on that KTM or or that Honda just to see how it compares to what you were on, or, or did that never sort of really come into your mind? Um, I had a couple of offers from different manufacturers, um, and you know that happened pretty much right up until my LPE days. Um, but I think that. I, I I did I had so much kind of spare package if you like um, the workshop still full of wheels and tires and spares and you know and everything else so we had everything on site that we needed to fix pretty much anything so uh, it seemed almost pointless to change to another manufacturer because it's not just the bike it's it's everything else that goes with it. Um, but at the same time, you know, in terms of performance, I know there was a lot of hype about KTMs and, you know, and Huskies and, you know, and everything else there, uh, which is which is great. But, you know, I was settled. I was happy. I was uh, I had such a good relationship with uh, Kawasaki UK and still do as well. Um, so there was never really a point that came to me. Um, I'm an in or flipping a coin as to you know where I was going to end up. 
And of course, as soon as I ended up in LPE Kawasaki, I think it was what I certainly would believe that there wasn't really a better option out there. Um, so at that point, I don't think that anyone really wanted or, or, or tried to send anything to compete in the same way that LP was able to offer. Um, because it was, you know, it was a full blown professional team um, at an AMCA race. It's just, yeah, okay. the, the, the was brilliant. You've always, you've obviously, you've always been a great ambassador for, for Kawasaki, you know, not, not just in the results that you've achieved, but what you do off and away from the track. I know, you know, how meticulous you, you are, um, and have been in your, 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 the way you present yourself, the professionalism of your setups, you know, uh, and that, that obviously impressed Kawasaki and, and obviously it's got to be part of the reason why even right up to, to today, they're still like prepared to, to, you know, support you and back you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, we, I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the, from the age of 14, there's definitely been some bad years. Um, so to receive sponsorship from anyone in, in bad years is, is always just amazing isn't it as well as the good years um the, i think i've never really uh, gone to someone and said i am going to do this this and this and and not achieved it or um or or kind of come back on that um i've never gone to someone or or, or sponsor and said I, i'm going to you know, when you're this title, when you're that title, when you're something else. I've always tried to be completely, you know, straight level and, you know, black and white with, with any such deal and, and and whatnot. In actual fact, the, the later on in, in my career, I didn't actually have any contracts or anything. It was all done on handshakes and, you know, word of mouth because there was so much mutual respect there that I knew that Steve was going to, you know, tell me something and he was going to honor that and likewise i'd do exactly the same for him you know because of that trust and because of that relationship it, it um the bond was is is you know was real good um the kawasaki thing i you know that they, they i i know that they were uh, aware that i had other you know deals in place or other um manufacturers wanted to wanted me to step over to what they were doing uh, but I knew that they wouldn't. The, they they knew that I wouldn't have gone anyway um, because they supported me in the bad years. You know, the, the motocross is such a small industry. It's such a small world. It's such a small, close knit of you know people that everyone knows everyone who's um, anyone who, who, and even people who's not. Um, that you kind of you burn one bridge, you end up burning all of them. You've got to be super kind of um, uh, professional and. You've got to have uh, a plan to, you know, everything if you like. Uh, the the Kawasaki relationship through racing was, um, like I said, for you know, good through the bad and the good. And I think as soon as I stopped racing, they were. Um, I'd like to think they were, and they and they did say that they were gutted uh, because they lost the the AMCA um, Kawasaki you know, out of the front, they'd lost the MCA kind of Kawasaki in, in the pits and of course the setup and the, and the package that, you know, went with it. Um, the, the deal that's kind of in place now, um, is again, back from, from when we first started. Um, and of course they help it. So uh, they, they support the LDR training facility, uh, in a huge way. And it's, um, Again, the, you know, there's no way that I would, you know, leave what they were doing. Um, and I'm sure the feeling's mutual there. That I'm sure that they wouldn't uh, jeopardize not being part of the setup because the connection's been there for, what are we now, 35 years old and, and probably since we are about 14. And before then, you know, my dad had supported uh, riders through the backing of Kawasaki previously. So 
you know, the connection's been so long and so kind of thorough that um, it almost seems right to stick with them and honour what they were doing um, and then to, you know, do exactly the same for, for us as what we were doing for them. It's, yeah. Okay, uh, one last question uh, before we move on to the training uh, side. Um, when you was racing and obviously when you're in the good years, did there ever come a, a point where you thought, I wouldn't mind having a go at the Maxis Brit British Championship? I know you were like um, racing in the British Masters, but did you ever think at some point I might go across and try that or did that not sort of really come into the equation? No, it didn't really come into the equation. Um, I mean, don't forget, I was working, you know, five days a week, then racing on the weekends, training before work, training after work. Um, you know, I was in a, a team where there were full-blown professional athletes who were able to ride seven days if they wanted to. Um, and for me, it wasn't able, I, I just wasn't able to commit to a seven-day-a-week program uh, without any income at all, it, it, you know, I mean, I say without any income at all, without, you know, my works income, if you like. Um, I wasn't able to commit or structure my uh, weeks around that. It, it just wasn't possible. And if I was going to do something like the British, uh, like the Maxis or, or, you know, a similar championship, then I'd need to make sure that I was absolutely 100% committed to it. Uh, the odd one-off round and things, you know, it seemed completely pointless to me to go to an event like that um, or, or another event that wasn't on my calendar and potentially risk a broken finger or, you know, a, a damaged engine or a damaged fault leg or, or, or anything uh, when, you know, I had more important things in my eyes to, you know, seal those championships that I did. Um, so... I think if I was to go back and, and maybe look back on what I've done in my career, uh, then I would probably have changed my schoolboy career to uh, get inv getting involved at an earlier age, maybe with a coach or a um, or, or some kind of um, mindset trainer to direct me in a different way, in which case I would have believed that I was able to do it earlier. Uh, and therefore, when I was younger, then then I could have, you know, maybe gone on to that level and, you know, possibly higher if I'd have done something younger, you know, to try and do that at 25, 28 years old. It just, you know, I'm working five days a week. It just wasn't realistic to achieve those goals. Just, you know, so no, I didn't. Okay, um, right, so what, once you um, finished your racing career, um, you went on to become a qualified motocross coach. I guess that was always in the plan, um, that you would go into motocross coaching, is that correct? Or So I wanted to stay within the industry. Um, in actual fact, I had a, a sponsor offer me a job um, with neck braces, um, which was fantastic, you know, it was, you know, a dream job, if you like. Um, but the, as soon as I'd, as, as soon as I'd finished my racing career, there was um, quite a lot of people that were, off, you know, wanting me to help them or offered some guidance, some setup advice, some kind of um, fitness advice. So, um, I, you know, it started off real small and I didn't advertise, didn't kind of, um, want to promote it too much, just keep it nice and small and, you know, nothing too serious, if you like. Uh, but within probably six months, um, I had the option of, you know, being part of uh, or, or taking over a facility, which is obviously what we've got today. Um, and then 12 months after that, it was just seven days a week, um, you know, training and coaching and offering people experiences on on bikes um and it, it with kind of that door that was opened um at the facility it gave me the option to give people an experience that they, they'd never ever um had before 
And what I mean by that is I wasn't trying to convince the people that already had bikes that they should buy more bikes. I was trying to work and convince people that hadn't, haven't got bikes to then go and buy bikes. And that's still what happens now. Um, so we run different experiences uh, for kids from four years old all the way up to, I think, the oldest participant we had has been 73 years old. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so it's been, it's been kind of a, a wild ride, if you like. We've met so many different people, um, so many different backgrounds, so many different uh, ways of life. Uh, but there's one thing that they've all got in common, and that is just, they absolutely just love bikes. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's raining, it doesn't matter whether it's warm, it doesn't matter whether it's cold. They're just so happy not to be at work, not to be, um, you know, doing the daily life dramas that you, you know, that we all face. And they're out and, you know, just enjoying time out on the bikes. And I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to, you know, give our sport, if you like, to, you know, everyone else is, is phenomenal. It is um Every day I go down to work and I just think I am so lucky. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I guess when you get a rider like somebody who's in effect never rode an off-road off -road bike before and you, and, you, and you can see them progress as you're coaching them, that, that must give you a lot of satisfaction you know, from a, a complete novice and you can see them come to grips with the circuit, come to grips with the bike and make progress. Yeah, 100%. There's no, uh, pro progression is a coach's best, uh, you know, the, the, what they look for most. Um, the, if I'm just like playing things back in my mind now and there's one kind of student that stands out more than uh, the rest. Um, and, and he's not on a motorcross scene at all. Um, I taught someone uh, last year uh, who uh, wasn't able to hear me. Uh, I don't know sign language. Um, he wasn't able to hear me. He wasn't able to hear the bike, the notes, the sounds, uh, had any instruction at all, completely zero. Um, so we kind of switched methods and we used a uh, visual learning. And um, basically what that is, is um, copying. So I'm doing something, he's doing something, and we're copying and copying and copying. And this guy is now riding a clutch and gear bike around the circuit within two hours. He's standing, he's sitting, his legs out, he's changing up, changing down. And it's not until you actually kind of sit back, see that, and realize what's, what's happening that you think, whoa, you know, this is just something else. I mean, we've all done some cool stuff on bikes, but this is just a different level. And to see it, to be part of it, and to and know that that is just part of the journey, uh, to part of that guy's journey uh, into a whole other world now. You know, he's he, he's got restricted um, everything already, and to give him another door that he can express uh, his. Um, skills and life and everything else with it on bikes is just well yeah blows me away yeah that, that, that's incredible Lee. um also do you um still do like the corporate um coaching days or is it just like um you know individual one-on-ones no so the whole host of things so basically whatever you can think of on bikes we do um, obviously from one-to-ones, um, from people who've never seen bikes, people who are in British Championship, all the way up to um, corporate days of large companies to MX tryouts, MX, um, experience days to um, businesses that want to have uh, fun days or team building days uh, to red letter days to... You know, to packages of uh, of motocross riders, motocross racers, or or bringing it all together. Um, the fitness side of things, start side of things, everything that you could imagine, uh, we're able to to do. 
And um, I, I know that you're going to ask me in a minute, um, but the kids side of things, we, you know, is just an, a whole other level. So as soon as you ask me that question, then we're, you know, I, I'll, I'll inform everyone of what's what's going on there. But that is just something else. That's uh, that's a whole other level of fun on bikes. Okay, before we get to that bit of it. Um, are you still um, also mentoring um, some some of the up and coming youth riders? I know you were going going with them to like championship events and and looking after them. Is is that still happening or? Yeah, exactly. So um, I follow the British Youth Championship. Uh, in my eyes, it's the best youth championship there is. Um, along with you know, there's I, there's there's so many different championships out there. Uh, but in my eyes, they predominantly um they predominantly put on a championship specifically for youth riders and i know that a lot of championships all do you know a great setup uh the bsma do a great setup the you know the the um mx nationals do a great setup and, and so does everyone else uh but for me the byc for the youth riders solely uh they do a, 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 a championship that's directed for them and of course on the back of them then then there's access into um the, the you know the worlds and the emx's and and everything else so um i run a program that you riders follow and um and it's, it works really really well i'm super happy with um with everyone that's been on the on the program and also everyone that's on the program at the moment um, and I go to those races and just guide them and help them and just kind of take all of the race day emotions away and, and just give them with positive um, information to encourage and bring out the best in what they can do. Uh, I'm not really too worried um, whether, you know, I've got someone who's um, not going to be a British champion. I just want them to be the best they possibly can be. Uh, for themselves and um, right now at the moment obviously you know we're not on bikes we're doing a hell of a lot of fitness um, and structured programs through day-to-day -day, weekly um, events and challenges that I'm giving them and just to see them enjoy and hit their PBs and come back to me on a daily basis saying do you know what Lee I've absolutely smashed it today send over the data to me and just see them you know beaming from ear to ear you know makes it all worthwhile yeah that's great i mean what's your current views on the youth racing scene in the uk do you think overall it's heading in the right direction or is there sort of areas where you think it could be a little bit better <laughs> yeah i i think that um i think this is a can of worms um, if I, I think that we can do better, definitely. Um, and what I mean by that is getting funding for progression within the youth ranks. Um, and I think that that's got to come with either like huge outside investment, which I don't think that we're going to get, uh, or um, internal investment, i.e., from the government or um sport group britain and you know those guys uh given a delivered structured plan uh to progress up to a professional athlete should they want to um in terms of are we on the same level or do we have similar opportunities to what europe or perhaps the states do i don't i don't think we're quite there yet um i don't think we will be for a while unless we get you know, some serious um, financial input and some changes. Um, and maybe everyone bang their heads together and everyone get on the same page so that we're delivering and structuring, you know, just less championships, but in more a structured way that it can enhance youth riders progression. Then, yeah, I, we could talk all day on that. And I don't think we'd ever get a uh a plan that would suit everyone uh, it just yeah i, I we would just stop there on that one 
Oh, okay, we'll, we'll move on from that one then. Um, yeah. Right, for, for 2021, um, something that you, you touched on just a few minutes ago, um, you, you've got the Osset Academy. I've, I've seen the video. I think it's absolutely fantastic and a, a great way for, for young kids to get involved and get a feel for what the sport's about um, and on electric bikes as well. Um, what, what can you tell us actually about that Osset Academy? Yeah, so uh, it's called the LDR Osset MX Academy for Kids. Um, the the way it came about was uh, my eldest son, Jet, uh, we put him into uh, football uh, tots, the rug rugby tots, football tots. And uh, whilst watching there, I was thinking, do you know what, this is just, it's not football, it's not rugby, it's just fun with a ball or fun with rugby, uh, uh, fun with a rugby ball, fun, fun with a football. And I said, um, why can't we do this with bikes? Why can't we kind of get this kind of vibe, but at a motocross circuit or, uh, or, or, you know, in that kind of way in or delivered on bikes. Um, so I approached a couple of electric bike companies. Um, Osset came back to me almost instantaneously with, right, we want in. Um, so, you know that's how it kind of progressed from zero to hero we made a specific circuit we enclosed it we've got different kind of um track markings that are able to fold and bring back up the tapes all on the floor we've made it completely child friendly all of the jumps are not jumps they're kind of just mounds and and kind of fall off the side and things and you're completely you know safe with it all um we've we've made it so that people uh, can turn up and ride uh, completely affordable pricing um, and just have super amounts of fun all on on electric bikes and of course the Osset delivers uh, a motocross bike um, with dimmer switch control so it means that the LDR coaches are able to control the bikes uh, even for the the most um, beginner or beginners that, that are on the bikes we're able to control them in a way that's safe for them and um, host a controlled session three hours so we do 15 minute blocks you know for three hours um, in, in the circuit and it just delivers such a fun package for four to eight year olds um, we kind of we produce some a package that people don't even need their own bikes. They can turn out, they can hire ours, and um, just just get involved. Just just come out, get to the circuit, meet like-minded people, um, and enjoy our sport. Of course, with the with the Osset Academy as well, and with these uh, with these bikes, it's enabled us to um, have birthday parties there as well. So. Um, if you've got a four to eight year old and you know you want to do something out of the ordinary just complete fun the whole time then yeah you can completely block book the circuit block book the bikes and the instructors and just have similar to what you would do go-karting uh, but at LDR on the Ossets uh, in the Osset Academy and uh, yeah if you haven't already seen the video it's on I'm sure you'll share it as well Mark, but, uh, Mike but it's on um, it's on my Facebook or Instagram, and uh, you can just have a look and see what it's all about. And it's just the, the funnest of fun days on bikes. Uh, it's strictly for complete beginners or novice beginners. Uh, so anyone who's uh, you know slightly intimidated by other people, don't be. Um, anyone who's worried about noise, completely don't worry about that either, because of course they're electric. Um, it's to get anyone and everyone and to give everyone and anyone the opportunity to come ride ride bikes at a completely affordable price. I've so got that, to say, that, I think, I, so I think that's, that's for me. That's for you? Yeah, that's for me. Uh, <laughs> hey, we're good, Mike, but we're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, we're talking about the younger riders then um also during your coaching um time um i you've got managed to get motocross as part of a school curriculum um can you sort of fill us in on how that happened i think it's was it a low a local school in north nibley is that correct 
Yeah, uh, kind of, yeah. So North Nibley um, is a local village to where, where the circuit is. Um, they're, they're actually a primary school, so the, the motocross in the curriculum is, is not for them. Uh, but what we do with North Nibley Primary School is um, similar to cricket club or football club or ballet or anything like that. Uh, which was an after-school um, activity for that school, we, we do a similar thing. So um, North Liberty Primary School, they've done it for a few years. They pop down, you know, after school, and we take them for motocross club. And that's, again, you know, similar to the Offset Academy, um, just a different level of fun. It's, it's amazing. Uh, but the motocross um, GCSE um, was something that Simon Newell of Chiltern Young Riders, he um, initiated, he got up running, he got started. Um, and basically, I just tagged onto the back of what they were doing. Um, it involves uh, one third of your P um, part of your GCSE course. Um, a lot of people think that because you ride bikes that it's instantly it's an A star and you know you're going to be right I'm going to fail everything but I'm going to be A star at motocross um, GCSE is it's not it's um, it it takes you it strips all the fat away um, and it talks and works on complete basics all the way up to riding and. Um, just just basic controls and basic con you know riding all the way up to the more experienced stuff um, but it's aimed at people who have never ridden before um, all the way up through and it's completely down to uh, the school I mean originally it was in edXL and it was in their kind of uh, curriculum um, to be totally honest I've been you know, on a back step of that for certainly the last 12 months or, or maybe even 18 months now. Uh, it might even be longer than that. So I'd have to get updated uh, from Simon on, you know, whether that's still even going or whether it's still in part of it. I knew that it was super hard to uh, for Simon to get it. And then I knew that it was under observation to, to see how many people actually used it. And I know that um, there's I've, I've had an awful lot of inquiry about it uh, but the schools that the pupils have gone back to have always been quite kind of reserved with don't actually kind of feel that that's wanted or, or part of their program um, or it didn't fit in with them. But at the same time, there are schools out there that uh, do seem to be quite encouraging of any access, any exercise to promote their students in a way that they're able to uh, give them better grades or, or better performance at school. Um, so we so we do deal with a lot of customers who are either underachieving or next year we've got a, a block booking for the whole year for one student who's uh, I think he's two or three years advanced on his schooling. Um, so in which case he's in a position that he's able to, um, you know, step away from his structured schoolwork, um, just so that he can use motocross as a as a big confidence and kind of de-stress and a chill out area. Um, it works in so many different ways. Bikes, you know, obviously you've got the motocross on the race side, but you've also got to look at it the other side. That is, you know, it's a massive luxury. Um, and we can use that luxury to uh, change negativity into positivity and providing we can do that um, and you know you can you can structure your days and you can structure your classes in that way then even the most negative of teachers and, and most negative of people in you know close to a circuit can be on the same wavelength as what you're trying to achieve then and it makes riding um, it becomes seen in a different light. Okay, um, one final question for you then, Lee. Um, obviously, hopefully, we'll soon get the lid on this on on the COVID pandemic, and you'll be able to get on and do um, what you enjoy doing. You know, um, coaching and teaching, um, etc. What what sort of in the plan um, for two thousand and twenty one? as it stands, um, taking the COVID away? 
Uh, so last year, um, we were going to launch a, a summer race school. So we always do a winter race school, which is basically a, uh, a prep for the, the race season. Um, and then we were going to uh, go into a summer season. Um, and of course, we weren't able to achieve those, uh, the, the, you know, that. So, you know, our main goal is to uh, bring that summer race school into play. Uh, basically, it's just a rotation of circuits uh, each week. And uh, it's, it doesn't affect schoolwork in any way. It's a program that's designed to uh, for, you know, youth riders so they can go to school, come away from school, go straight into motocross club, if you like. And we can do some uh, intense pr um, training uh, to, uh, to, to work for their race uh, season. Um, the main idea with, behind that is, or was, um, just to compete with the, the, you know, the trainers and riders that are able to get time off of school to, to be able to ride. Um, I know, you know, a lot of the Southern guys and girls, you know, we're, we're just not able to do that. Um, you know, whether we should or shouldn't do that is a completely different question, but we're just not able to do that. Um, so I've tried to make this program fit around school because um, I believe that's super important. Uh, and it works towards their racing goals. So that's one side of it. Um, the LDR Offset Academy is a, is a, is another side, and uh, that wasn't really kind of offered to anyone last year. Um, so it's going to start up this year, um, you know, f completely 100 mile an hour, and, you know, we're going to push that as much as we possibly can. Um, but we've also got a whole host of new LDR Kawasaki experiences, which uh, come from taste sessions, which people can, um, again, turn up in flip-flops and shorts, and we provide everything uh, to get them on their, on their motocross or, or off-road bike. Or even, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to pass a CVT and you're too nervous to ride in a car park full of cars and cones and things, then come and see us where we've got a 20 acre facility that you can ride and ride and ride. And there's, you know, there's nothing around you. So all of these packages will all come together and they'll all be just enhanced a little bit. We already do a lot of these, but they're just enhanced and they're progressed and they're, you know, they're, they're evolved with the times. Um, then bring in that 21 summer race school for the, you know, the hardcore races and then also the LDR Osset Academy as well. So the umbrella for LDR now is starting to grow into, into different avenues and different routes um, and different, and the routes to market and the way that we're going to market them are, are just progressing as well. We've got a whole host of things just sat there. Um, we're just waiting for, you know, what the green lights, you know, when the green light comes and, and what we have to deal with in those situations. And then, uh, and then everything will start blossoming, if you like. Everything will start growing, and um, it's exciting. The the good thing with the bikes is, you know, you can you can put bikes, and you can have bikes, and you can mold your day, and you can mold kind of uh, a structure into anything. You've just got to have that kind of ambition, that drive, that goal, that kind of. Um, that vision to see where you want it to go and what you can achieve and don't get me wrong it's definitely not easy and you know some days we've literally not slept we've we've been working all night just to either sort bikes or sort the circuit out or sort the machines out um just to make it happen but we you know we all uh, we all work together and we're really really um lucky to have you know, a whole host of um, members of LDR that all play a huge part into trying to make it successful. Okay, and uh, finally, is, is there any practice days um, planned? Um, again, COVID permitting for 2021? Definitely. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because, um, you know, my, it, it, Everyone's got their own ideas on COVID and, you know, and again, that's another can of worms. Um, but, it, you know, in my eyes, it, 
wherever the end is, you know, whether it's in a week's time or whether it's in six or seven months' time, um, we've all just got to make sure we're at the finish line together. Uh, now, whether I end up doing practice days this year or next year or the year after, doesn't it doesn't really affect me too much. Um, just it would just be great to see everyone at those days at some point enjoying the circuit. Um, but for sure, it, you know, as soon as we can, as soon as we're able to, great, we'll do it. Okay, that's uh, that's just about it. Thanks, Lee, for doing this. It's, it's really much appreciated, and it's great to see you again. Although it's only on screen, but uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Pleasure. No worries, Mike. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching.